My job today, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it, but my job today in the short amount of time that I have is to try and look at some key indicators, key markets, and take into consideration where we have been in the past, where we are now, and what is potentially in our future. That's why it's called an outlook. Um, what I've chosen to do is break this into two components, the world and the US, agricultural outlook, and I'm gonna focus on a few key things. First is world demand for our key agricultural products. I'm going to take a look at the US farm sector income statement, which is what I consider the barometer of the agricultural economy. Take a look at the major root crop acreage, and also two key markets, corn and soybeans, our two biggest root crops. Look at their supply and demand, and then draw some conclusions, I hope, for you about part of where we are in our agricultural economy is a consequence of US farmers' great productivity, a victim of their own success, if you will. Then I'm gonna take a few moments, similar to what Mike did, and talk about North Carolina specifically. I've got some new estimates and some new numbers about what our free going deficit is. You all know how important animal agriculture is in our economy here. It's the, it's, accounts for about three quarters of our cash receipts and uh, I've got some ins insights on that talk about what we have quite a bit higher than the arrow we have in 2018 and the blue line reflects that our net cash receipts are declining on average about five billion dollars annually and that is a trend in economics we say two dots make a line three dots make a trend okay the red line shows the expenses. They're going up about $2 billion. The point about this graph is to say, and this is a thing that economists uh, term a cost price squeeze. That is, US farmers are currently subject simultaneously to increasing costs and decreasing prices. What does that basically mean? Margins are tighter. So, we have to manage that. But this can change very quickly, okay? And that's where I want to move to next. Before I do that, let's take a look at acreage. Why do I care about acreage? The key thing here is when you look at our major row crops, we have 240 million acres in agricultural production broken out between corn, wheat, soybeans, and cotton. Right now, uh, soybeans and, and corn are pegged equally at about 89 million acres. So why would I want to focus on the 240 million acres of land? What do you see about that line? Is there a trend there or is it flat? It's flat. So let's go back a few slides. World demand is increasing for corn, soybeans, wheat, and they're also the major inputs into animal agriculture. So there's no more acres in production. So how are we going to meet this increased demand? There's only one way. We have to be more productive. That's one of our big missions at NC State. And I'm about to show you that US farmers are doing just that. We have had bumper record crops in corn and soybeans the last couple of years. And we're only a very small margin away from, get this, running out of corn and soybeans. You might say, Piggott, what are you talking about, man? You're crazy. I want to show you the numbers, okay? I, I do want to point out one thing on this about the acreage is there's that blip in there with corn and soybeans and this is going to become important later on in what I have to say. That blip was when we had the new uh, Energy Act and we had a big increase in corn acres over soybeans and that was driven by what? We went from almost no ethanol 
to half of our corn crop being used for ethanol. But what happened quickly after that, you see that corn and soybean acres went back in alignment. Why do they go in alignment? Because they compete for the same acreage. Remember that in about four or five slides when we talk about prices. So let's look at corn supply and demand disappearance. First thing I want to point out production, that red line. Three bumper crops, three record years back to back. Okay? The total use that is almost overlaying that shows you we don't have much margin of error here if we have a crop short, shortfall. I'm going to talk about that some more. But you can see our domestic use continues to rise. Uh, food, seed, demand and industrial, mostly ethanol, that's starting to flatten out because we've hit what we call the blank wall. And exports are up a little bit. Okay? But this is where we're getting into the money action slide now. This is ending stocks. Okay? Ending stocks are how much we have over after we use everything in a particular year versus what we produced. And what do you see in this graph? In 2010, 2011, because of that ethanol policy and for independence, we were in our ending stocks down to almost record lows. Then since then, farmers responded, we continue to grow more and more corn, and we've had a run up in ending stocks. Right now, ending stocks are 1.7 um, billion bushels. Okay? On average, it's about 1.8. Here's the number I want you to think about. This should bring you optimism. Okay? With ending stocks of 1.7 billion bushels on 81.8 million acres, if we have a crop shortfall of only 22 bushels, which is about 12% of expected production, and we still have all the tails and feathers to feed, what is our carryout going to be? Zero. No corn. Think about that. No one's wishing for a natural disaster or a drought or something, but that's how close we are to the edge. So there's some potential optimism there. The other thing is, is if demand continues to increase, that's another way to get there as well, because yields might be able to keep up. So economists like to use this thing called stocks to use ratio, and here it is for corn. The blue line shows price, pink line shows stocks to use. I want to draw your attention to 2011 when we got down to about 7%. Look where prices were. $6.50 six corn. With this run up in ending stocks, and we see now that has now turned because demand is outweighing supply, even though we've had bumper crops, um, the tide is potentially ready to turn because what's going to happen if that pink line gets any lower? What happened last time? We could see a doubling in corn prices. Remember? 12% shortfall and expected yield, we're going to have really high right corn prices. Okay. Let's talk about where the futures market is right now. Forget about what the media says, what people say in newspapers. The best thing to look at is what its corn price is going to do. Go look at the futures market. Why? Because if you think don't agree with the futures market, you can go in, take a position and make money. So right now the futures market says new crop corn next year is going to be $4.10. But right now you'll see it's been trading sideways. What is that telling us? Market's not really sure if, whether it should go up or down. But I want you to remember the number $4, okay? Because there's a little special relationship agricultural economists use and that's the ratio of soybean prices to corn prices. Okay, the magic number is 2.4. So remember corn at $4. Okay. 
Last thing I want to say is corn and soybeans are in the period where they're bidding for acreage. So if the market wants to have more corn, what has to happen? Corn futures have to go up, farmers plant more corn. Why is that? It comes back to the, the, my point that we don't have any additional acreage. Okay. Let's talk about soybeans. Look at that green line. In fact, look at the last five years in soybeans. What do you see? Back-to-back -back record production. That's US farmers doing an excellent job of producing soybeans. What do you see with the total use line? It's going up too. Okay. We almost passed a point a year ago where we were exporting more soybeans than we were crushing. Now exports have dropped off a little bit and you might want to attribute that to tariffs and that's possible. But they haven't fallen to the floor, okay? And if I have time we can talk about that a little bit more. But the big story about soybeans is the uh, ending stocks. Pretty big number. Ending stocks this year went up over 100%. Okay, almost a billion bushels of soybeans we have in ending stocks. So let's do the math again. With almost a billion bushels, 88.3 million acres, we can afford a 20% yield drop and we'd be out of soybeans. Okay, so we have. The so leftover soybeans is a bigger problem, okay? But we don't have enough to afford a big crop shortfall. So let's go back to the ending stocks. Same story. The pink line shows you how much the stocks to use has increased, and there should be an inverse relationship. Look at the price response. It hasn't been very inverted hasn't really gone up. Why is that? Because the demand has still been so strong. But think about if we can run down these ending stocks, we'll see soybean prices really exceed again. All right, let's look at um, the soybean futures again. Forget what the media says, forget what you people say about China and what it's done to the soybean market. Let's look at where the market players who actually are buying and trading soybeans in principle, because we do have funds that go in this market and that's a whole different story. But look what's happened here. I just showed you an incredible large ending stock in soybeans. And what is soybean prices doing? last three months they've gone up almost a dollar. Look back in uh, June we had soybean prices at ten dollars and they dropped all the way down to 870 a pretty significant decline. Some people in the media will say that's tariffs. Pickett says that's another fifth big year of soybean production, we've got a big pile of soybeans, so price has to go down. So soybean prices have gone up. All right, what was the magic number? 2.4. That's when corn and soybeans, the equilibrium is that acreage will stay the same. Soybeans today, or last week, $9.60. $9.60 divided by 4 is what? 2.4. So from a strictly economic standpoint, these markets are in a pretty decent long-term equilibrium. And in the next few months, the market may send a signal to farmers, depending on which one rallies, to plant more corn or soybeans. But right now, if it doesn't change, we're going to have about the same acreage again. And with that strong demand, what's going to happen? We're going to whittle down those ending stocks and our prices will come back. So that's a key insight. 
That's just looking at the markets, forgetting all the, the chatter and noise about tariffs. And I'm not saying they didn't impact. What I'm telling you right now is the markets have it in check. Okay? A little historical exercise about where we were. So this is world corn prices and world soybean prices. So clearly you can see back in the 2007, 2008 when we had the Energy Act, corn prices were the highest in history, or almost. And what did that do? That rose all tides. Soybean prices were very high too. Why? Because soybeans and corn compete for acreage. You can see right now, corn and soybean prices are close, closest to a real low. Hopefully I've convinced you that's predominantly because farmers have been so good at how much they've produced, we've had big supplies, we can't afford to not do that. Remember my numbers about what would have happen if we had crop shortfalls. And I hope I've convinced you that the demand's there so we can be optimistic that what's going to happen is these prices should increase. But one other thing, and this is probably my key insight and takeaway that uh, it's not necessarily clear, what this picture shows you is the relative changes in corn and soybean prices from 2008 to 2018. Okay? When we had the big run up in corn and soybean prices, what do you notice? Price volatility sometimes was greater than 20%. Volatility is your friend, volatility is your enemy. Most farmers and agricultural producers spend a lot of time worrying about volatility. They worry about volatility because prices might go down. That means you have to have risk management. But volatility is also your friend because prices can go up and that's where you've got to pull the trigger and sell. But what happened in that period is we had low ending stocks. That explained in part the volatility. Why? Because the market was nervous if we had any crop shortfalls, what would happen to price? It had to go up to clear the market. Well, now we have these big ending stocks. Look what's happened to volatility. It's more than halved. So a benefit of the lower prices right now is we have a lot less volatility. That has implications for marketing and risk management, but taking some of the volatility out should be more reassuring to farmers about making decisions in the future. Okay, So that's a gift of the lower prices. But if we get lower rending stocks, which I think we're going to if demand continues to rise, we'll get the volatility back. Okay, I want to now turn to North Carolina. And I really want to concentrate on two things. Our acreage, on particularly feed grains, and uh, our feed grain deficit. So this is a concern, but it's also an opportunity. In the past 11 years, let, let me, before I say this, everyone should be aware that the number one part of our cash receipts in the agricultural economy is animal agriculture, about 67% of cash receipts. Hogs, broilers, turkeys, okay? And it should be natural that we have as much feed grains in our own backyard because our customers are right there. But what this chart shows you that over the past 11 years, total planted acres to row crops in North Carolina has gone down by almost 11%, but feed grain acres has gone down 19%. That's a concern. Corn acres have increased about 3%. Wheat acres, which is probably the biggest concern I see right now, it's declined by 43%, but that really masks something that happened. During and I'm going to talk about the grain initiative very quickly, but 
In 2013, we had almost a million corn uh, wheat acres. Today, the best guess of how many acres we could get in the ground is less than 200,000. That's a five-fold decrease. What happened? Wheat prices have been weak, but what happened after Florence? It rained, it rained, it rained, and we couldn't get wheat in. So our wheat acres are way down. Remember, weather events and crop shortfalls, we're going to have a big price response. Okay? So that's a concern that I have about the feed grain acres. I will say that in 2018, they went up about 5%. So, at NC State, we did a, a, a three-year project in 2012-2014. It was funded by Smithfield, and the whole idea was, what can we do to increase feed grain acres in this state? And this is a plot of what happened to feed grain acres. So here's the pre-grain initiative, here's during the grain initiative, and here's what's happened post. So when we put a full call press on working with farmers, offering better basis, and for those of you who don't know what basis is, that's the additional component of our cash price that you add on to futures to account for local demand and supply. When basis was increased, farmers responded and we grew almost 180 million bushels of feed grains. Okay? We're now down to about 140, but we had the potential to do that. So these are some new numbers that I recently calculated. I get asked this a lot, and I'll just cover it briefly. Um, so feed grain acres, when you take a five-year average, roughly produce about 150 million feed grain acres in this state every year. And it depends if we have a hurricane or not. There's some, some variance. But the bottom part of this table adds up the tails and the feathers. What does it take three times a day, every day, all year long, to feed the tails and the feathers in the state? Well, the answer is about 310 million bushels. And that was one of our biggest concerns after Florence, was not just the initial impact of the storm, but how can we make sure these animals are fed? Because the feed truck comes three times a week, and we had 10 days where some roads were in passing. But that's another story. So 150 million bushels of feed grains we have to get from somewhere else every year. Well, in 2018, that increased by about 3 million bushels. 30 million bushels, I'm sorry. That's because we had lower corn acreage, and it wasn't because of Florence, it's because it didn't rain in the right time. And then, of course, I've already told you the story about wheat. So right now, we've got to go and find all these additional feed grains just to keep the tails and feathers alive. This is another piece of analysis I've done. And it shows that since uh, 97 to 2006 and 2007 to 2016, corn basis has increased 32 cents a bushel. That's good and bad for farmers in North Carolina, depending who you are. If you're a corn farmer, that means the average price you've got for corn has gone up 30 cents because this reflects the cost, that, the additional cost it takes us to get corn into the state. So I just told you the numbers 150 million we have to do every year. That additional 30 cents adds up to quite a bit of money. Okay? 30 cents a bushel times 150, that's real money. Okay? Um, we've already got a shortfall this year in eight, uh, feed, so what we should see locally on the demand and supply situation is corn and wheat and soybean basis should improve because if we can't grow it locally, we're going to go get it somewhere else. And on average, we pay about a dollar ten or a dollar thirty, depending on freight rates per bushel. Okay. So this is a thought. There's a lot on this slide. 
But one thing we could do as a state is think about if this continues to rise, the cost of bringing corn into the state or feed grains, uh, it really threatens the vitality of our livestock industry. So one thing we could think about is investing in infrastructure that will address some of the current inefficiencies and potentially lower the cost of doing that. I'm talking about railways, roads and ports. Investing in that will not only help North Carolina agriculture, it's probably going to help some of our other industries as well. Um, but in the interim, we can expect stronger basis because local integrators are interested in buying more feed grains from North Carolina. That's a good thing for our farmers. We can potentially be self-sufficient in five or ten more years if we continue productivity in feed grains. And I'm sure you, a lot of people are aware about the, the Plant Science Initiative NC State. I expect part of that mission will be to continue to increase yields of these major crops for our state. Okay? So let me try to wrap up here. And I hope when I finish here, you're going to feel a little bit optimistic about the next few years for agriculture. So we talked about world demand, and it looks like it's really strong. That's great. The farm sector balance sheet wasn't great, but it probably, hopefully, is showing the bottom. Why? Because I hope I've convinced you that balance sheet looks that way because of the very good job our farmers did in producing crops back to back, and at that time world demand even though it was strong, it was still not great enough and so we had these huge ending stocks. I hope I've convinced you that lower prices means lower price volatility and that's good for farmers. That means they worry less. But it has implications for the marketing opportunities and risk management. But the thing I want you to remember is it doesn't take much given the world demand and our prices can rebound significantly. And then finally, we talked about the feed grain deficit around 50%, it's up about 60%. The higher basis reflects that it's costing more to bring stuff in. That's an opportunity for our state to produce more feed grains locally, which is good for our farmers. It's good for the livestock industry. We'll keep the livestock industry here. Why is it so important to keep the livestock here industry here in North Carolina. What does North Carolina have that Iowa does not? An ocean. We can become the world's breadbasket for protein right here in North Carolina. We have an ocean, they don't. Keep that in mind. Where's most of that demand coming from? Internationally and in particularly China. So that's why I think it would be very wise to think about some future investments in the logistics and infrastructure that go along with our yield research. This definitely needs more analysis. And I just want to say, our college had that vision and we now in our department in Ag and Resource Economics have a, a junior faculty member dedicated to looking at transportation and logistics. And hopefully that was a very wise investment and that paints a, a, a much brighter future for North Carolina to be the world's bread basket for protein. That's all I have. Uh, I hope I leave you feeling optimistic um, and things can only get better from here. Um, and I hope the price increase we see is from stronger and stronger world demand and not from a natural disaster. So thank you very much.